to thank our esteemed uh, guest here, uh, Dr. Eric. Um, and he's taken the time to share with us uh, his knowledge um, of the US industry, as well as we will go deeper into price transparency conversations today. So thank you very much, uh, Eric, for taking this time today. I'll do a quick uh, uh, intro for myself, and then I'll hand it over to Eric uh, for his own intro as well. And then uh, we'll get right into uh, the exciting part of this conversation, which is uh, discussing US healthcare uh, ecosystem and impact of price transparency in the industry. So a little bit of myself, I've had the opportunity to be working with you for about a year and a half. Uh, very excited uh, of the difference we are making at Genzian. I had the healthcare division at Genzian. Um, thank you for taking the time today because I think it's very, very critical that we not only solve the technical problems in this industry, but we solve the business problems. And to do that, we need to understand the industry that we are in. And to that end, uh, we have invited uh, Dr. Eric to spend time with us. Uh, uh, and I to Eric uh, uh, for his intro. Eric? Yes. Harsh, can you hear me okay? We can absolutely hear you, Eric. Thank okay. you. Okay. Wonderful. Listen, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be able to speak with all of you. So I'm Dr. Eric Bricker. I'm an internist. Um, to Harsh's point, this is an international call. I'm in Dallas, Texas, of all places. And I um, originally was a hospital finance consultant before becoming a physician. So when I was looking at all the, like, the billing projects that Genzion does, it was like near and dear to my heart. OK, because back in the 90s, I used to do that. And it was literally eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper that we would fold and put in envelopes. So thank you for for bringing all of us into the 21st century. It was horrible, as you can imagine. So um, then went on to medical school at the University of Illinois and then residency at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And then I actually started a healthcare, um, what's called a healthcare navigation firm. I'm sure as many of you know, the healthcare um, Healthcare is so complicated in America that you actually need sort of an expert um, sort of travel guide to guide you through the U.S. healthcare system. And so companies would hire our service and then give it to their employees as part of their sort of health insurance that they would get through their job. And so it was called Compass Professional Health Services. We actually grew it to 2,000 employer clients, T-Mobile, McDonald's, Southwest Airlines. Um, we had um, over 2,000 employer clients. We did it for about 2 million people. Uh, we ran that business for... Um, 11 years from 2007 to 2018 and then we sold it to a company called alight solutions um, which actually does a whole bunch of hr outsourcing it actually had a huge indian component that they actually then sold to an indian firm so it's, it's completely owned all of their indian employees are now owned by or, or work for the indian firm now and when i left as a result of the transaction in 2018 i started creating all these healthcare finance educational videos because understandably like you are not alone. The vast majority of people who work in healthcare in America actually don't understand healthcare. So it's actually very common. Uh, and so um, I started creating these videos called A Healthcare Z. They're on LinkedIn and YouTube. And I have viewers from all over the world. And guess who some of my what some of my largest view viewing audience is? It is software developers in India that work for United Healthcare because they themselves <laughs> don't understand why they're building the software for United that they're building. And so I'll just, I'll, I've will i been super long-winded. So thank you for being patient with me. We ourselves at Compass, we, had, we ended up growing about 300 employees. We had our own software you know, developers, et cetera. We had a, a, an IT department, about 30 people. And I would meet with our head of engineering and our lead architect or whatever. And they would tell me that, look, if you can explain to me how healthcare works and why we're creating the software that we're creating, it's actually going to enable us to create better software. So don't just give me a product person with a bunch of specs, like tell me why I'm doing this. And guess what? As a result of doing that, we absolutely created better software. And so that is my uh, wish for us today. Thank you, Dr. Bricker. This is wonderful. What an amazing journey you've been at. And certainly, you know, I think uh, the key message here uh, for the team here is not only are we spending time here, I think Dr. Bricker has created a lot of content that's available online that please do look up and utilize to your benefit as well, because the intent here um, of us all spending the time is to increase each other's knowledge um, so that 
to Dr. Bricker's point, we create better software. Um, so thank you, um, uh, Dr. Bricker. I would like if we can talk a little bit about, and uh, Stephanie, if, I, if we can share the uh, deck as well, um, that'll be wonderful. Um, if we can we talk a little bit about with us, a US healthcare system, why is it so complex? Paint a story, paint a picture for us uh, so that folks understand, you, you know, in it, uh, um, you know, why, why the complexity? Yeah, so that, that's great. And we do have some slides. And so if you're able to share whoever's kind of running the slides, if you can sure. share the slides and if you are not able to, that's OK. I, I can show them on my end. Just kind of let me know. And let me do, let me just kind yeah, of pause just, briefly. Just a second. Breaker, uh, while we bring up the slides, but while okay. while we do that, let's 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 have a conversation. There is so many aspects to U.S. healthcare. You know, we talk so many different things. There is different commercial models. There's commercial. There's Medicare. There's Medicare. There's so much going on. In your vision, if we were to say, "Hey, the complexity comes from this," that's right. Paint a story. That's right. So let's so let's start with that. Thank you, Harsh. So the complexity comes from the money. So the reason why I started a healthcare Z is because the way that the money flows in U.S. healthcare is very complicated. And so let's paint a picture of how the money flows in healthcare. So we need to start out with the U.S. government. So as many of you know. The U.S. government pays for a lot of health care through Medicare, and that's the government program for people age 65 and older. Now, of course, even Medicare itself is, is complicated. So Medicare itself is divided into two separate types of Medicare. There is what is called one, traditional Medicare, and then two, Medicare Advantage. And in traditional Medicare, a doctor or a hospital or a physical therapist or a pharmacy, they will bill. They will bill the government, they will bill CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and then Medicare will then pay them back for that service, whether it's an office visit or a surgery. Now, of course, the government sets the prices. So for traditional Medicare, in America, we essentially do have price controls for for health care services. So the government now. And we'll get into this, the hospital or the doctor or what have you. Oh, that's great. And if you can just go to slide three, that's where we start. So in uh, and we're going to get into sort of the, the high levels of billing, but essentially the government sets the reimbursement. So the government says, hey, you know, you have an office visit. We're going to pay you fifty five dollars for that office visit. Like there's no negotiating with us. Like that's what it is. OK, now. That's about half the people on Medicare have traditional Medicare. Now, um, and it, it, just to follow along on the slides, I'm, I'm on Medicare, which is the top part, and then I'm on point number two. OK, now traditional Medicare also doesn't have anything called prior authorization. Some of you are familiar with that. So where the doctor or the hospital needs to get, quote unquote, permission to do a surgery or permission to do a cardiac catheterization or something of that sort. And so in traditional Medicare, you don't there are no prior authorizations. You don't need, quote unquote, permission. Now, even though the government is paying for it, the individual patient has to pay some as well. So one, the um, the patient does have to pay a premium to Medicare. So you do have to pay in order to be a part of the Medicare program. And then your insurance as well has a deductible. So in other words, the part that you would have to pay out of pocket first. And then for outpatient services, it then has what's called coinsurance, which is 20%. So you also have to pay 20% of what the cost would be. So let's say you have some sort of outpatient procedure, like you have you know, some sort of odd growth on your skin in, the dermatologist has to take a biopsy and cut it off. The entire thing, let's say, costs five hundred dollars. You would have to pay twenty percent of that, or a hundred dollars. Okay, so fairly straightforward. You got a deductible, you got a coinsurance, you got premium, and then the prices are set by the government. So essentially, the government is the insurance company. Okay, so that's traditional Medicare. Now, if you go to point three, there. The other 50 percent of so that's for half of seniors in America. The other half of seniors in America have what's called Medicare Advantage, 
where they get their Medicare through a private insurance company. And Medicare says, you know, look, we're kind of, we're, this is enough of this. Can we just give a lump sum check to an insurance company that's about $18,000 per year per person and just be like, hey, you, Blue Cross United Signet, no, like you take care of all this billing and payment back or whatever. And if this senior costs less than $18,000, you get to keep the difference. And if this senior costs more than $18,000 in a year, well, that's on you. So you have to manage the risk for that individual member. So that's that's about half the people in America. It's about 20 there's about 23 million people in traditional Medicare and about another 23 million people that are in Medicare Advantage. And so, with Medicare Advantage, people are like, I have Medicare. Yes, but you have an insurance card that says Blue Cross on it, okay? So it looks like you have private insurance. All right? Now, because you have private insurance then, you do have prior authorization. So the doctor or the hospital, they're going to need to get permission from Blue Cross United Cigna or Aetna in order to do that test or procedure. Now, the reason why seniors sign up for Medicare Advantage is the insurance companies like, aha, because we're making so much money off the difference between the $18,000 and what this person actually costs me, then we won't charge a premium. So for a lot of seniors, it's less expensive in terms of premiums to sign up for Medicare Advantage. So in other words, the Medicare premium might be like 300 bucks a month and the Medicare Advantage might premium might be zero. It will be free. And then Medicare Advantage says, and we'll give you dental insurance. We'll give you vision insurance. We'll even pay for hearing aids because obviously a lot of seniors are hard of hearing. So half the seniors in America are like, this is great. I don't have to pay a premium and I get dental and vision and hearing aids, which is why Medicare Advantage has grown. Just 10 years ago, it was less than 20% of all Medicare beneficiaries, and now it's 50%. So it's more than doubled in the past 10 years. And if there is one major movement in healthcare in America today, it is that. It is the growth of Medicare Advantage such that now more seniors actually have their health insurance through a health insurance company, Blue Cross United Cigna Aetna, and not straight through the government. Okay, now I'm gonna apologize up front. I'm only getting warmed up. It gets even more complicated. Okay, so now let's talk about people who are under 65, who are very poor. Okay, sometimes they have a job, sometimes they don't, but there's a program separate that is called Medicaid. And Medicaid is administered through each one of the individual states, Texas, Illinois, Florida, et cetera. Now, half the budget for Medicaid actually comes from the federal government. The federal government says, look, you're taking care of the poor people in Florida. We're going to give you half your budget for Medicaid. But you, the state, you got to provide the other half of the budget. Then each of the states then actually set up their Medicaid programs similar to Medicare Advantage. So then the state Medicaid program contracts with Blue Cross United, Cigna, Aetna, or another Medicaid insurance company. And then the, the individual uh, poor people who qualify for it based on income can then go on a website and be like, okay, I live in Florida. I have several choices of which Medicaid plan I want. And then they get their Medicaid insurance, again, through a private insurance company. All right. And again, it's similar to Medicare Advantage in that you have um, uh, a prior authorization. You've got to get approval. You want your your you've got a bad hip and your orthopedic surgeon wants to give you a, a hip replacement. You can't just do that willy nilly. You have to get permission from Blue Cross United Cigna Aetna in order to be able to do that. And so from a software perspective, prior authorizations and helping doctors and hospitals with prior authorization is a huge deal. So you may have some projects related to that, which is why I'm kind of harping on it. Okay, now finally, we get to employer-sponsored commercial insurance. Okay, now, believe it or not, in America, the majority of Americans actually get their health insurance through their job. So it's about 60% of Americans get their health insurance through their job. So this is going to cover, now it's going to include spouses. So if the wife's working, it could cover the husband who maybe is not working, or if the husband's working, it might cover the wife who's not working, and it'll cover their kids. Their kids are in school, they're eight years old, they'll be on their family's insurance plan through their job. And again, it's done through a private insurance company, Blue Cross United, Cigna, and their employer 
Um, obviously, if you're in America, you get your health insurance through Genzion, and they've probably contracted with Blue Cross United or Cigna or Aetna to get your health insurance through one of those. Okay, now the um, the let's talk about the prices, okay? Because that's where things get very different. Because when a person with commercial insurance through their job goes to a doctor or a hospital, Blue Cross United, Cigna, and Aetna have to negotiate what that payment amount will be back to the doctor or the hospital. And those that, that payment amount and that negotiation is very complicated and it creates very complicated prices and it also creates very high prices. So the government dictates, Medicare dictates to the hospital, we're going to give you $15,000 for a knee replacement and you're going to like it. You're going to smile and you're going to say, thank you, government. However, Blue Cross, United, Cigna, and Aetna, when they go to the hospital, the hospital's like, look, there is no way you're getting the same deal as the government. That knee replacement, if you want to be in net, if you want us to be in network and, and us to take your insurance, you need to pay us $75,000 for that knee replacement. So this is where the hospitals will ask for two, three, four, five, sometimes 10 times more than what the government pays them. OK, so those prices are very high and they're highly variable. And so understanding that is actually very important because a lot of I, I, I've looked at your projects, right? A lot of your projects have to deal with claims processing, OK, and claims processing for TPAs and insurance companies, et cetera, et cetera, for commercial insurance is very complicated. So this is why I'm telling you I'm going to educate you around how claims processing works. Now, next slide, please. And let's do this. As you're going through in the, if you want, in the chat section, you can put in questions and then I'll answer them at the end. Okay. So I, you know, I might answer them like throughout the course of my presentation. So let me just kind of go, go through the presentation and then I'll answer them at the end, but please put the questions in. Okay. So the way that employer sponsored insurance is set up is through this diagram, okay? So there's four players, starting in the upper left. You have the employer, Genzion, we'll just use that as an example. Then you have the employee, Harsh, we'll use him as an, as an example, okay? And then you have what's referred to as the provider or the pharmacy, that's the doctor or the hospital or the pharmacy, which you get where you get your medication filled. And then you have the insurance company and the pharmacy benefit manager, okay? And there's a relationship among these four. So the obviously the employee works for the employer, the employee then goes to the doctor or the pharmacy to get their medical services. The provider or the pharmacy then bills the insurance company in order to get paid back, right? That's the, 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 the claims administration or the adjudication, if you will. And then the insurance company charges the employer for the plan. And it's very easy to calculate how much it costs because on average in America, health insurance costs about $10,000 per employee per year. Now, some employees are single employees and maybe they only cost 6,000 and some employees are spouse and three kids. And so they cost 20,000, but when you average it all out, it's $10,000 per employee per year on the health plan. So if you have 100 employees in America, you're spending a million dollars a year on healthcare. If you have $1,000 a year, you're spending $10 million a year on healthcare. And so it ends up being approximately anywhere from 15 to 25 percent of payroll. So payroll, what you got to pay your employees, is typically the number one expense for companies in America. The number two expense for companies in America is the health insurance for their employees. The, there's lots of famous sayings around here. So all the U.S. car companies for GM, they spend more on health insurance than they spend on any steel or parts to make their cars. They're essentially large health insurance companies. OK, um, Starbucks spends more on health insurance for their employees than they spend on coffee. So it is a huge expense and it goes up at about twice the rate of inflation. So when inflation is 4 percent, health care costs generally go up by about 8 percent. OK, when health care, when inflation has been 10 percent, 
close to 10% in America, healthcare costs have not gone up by 20%, but they still have gone up um, close to 10% themselves. So there's like the rule of 72. I'm sure many of you know the rule of 72 is that you take the percentage increase every year and you divide it into 72, and that's how many years it takes to double. So if something goes up by 7% per year, it doubles in approximately 10 years. So if health insurance in America goes up by about 7% per year, and I just told you it's $10,000 per employee, well, then in 10 years, it's going to be $20,000 per employee. And so every business in America is like, there's no way we can afford that. Okay. So that is, uh, now that is what is referred to there. I put these two letters here that's called FI, and that is for fully insured, which means that the employer pays the $10,000 per employee to the insurance company, and then the insurance company takes the risk. Let's say the employees on average cost $12,000 per year. Well, then the insurance company loses money. However, as you can imagine, the insurance companies are very good at setting their premiums such that on average, they make about 15% margin on each one of their members. So in, in other words, it only costs them about $8,500 to pay out the doctors in the hospital and the pharmacy or whatever, and then they get to keep $1,500 for every employee. So a lot of employers are like, well, I'm, it's you know basically health insurance companies in America, you can almost think of them like Visa or MasterCard. And so all the health, all the health insurance companies is doing is saying, okay, well, it's going to cost us about eight thousand five hundred dollars, so we're just going to call, charge you ten thousand dollars. And the employers are like, well, I don't want to pay an extra one thousand five hundred dollars for every one of my employees. Isn't there a better way? And there is a better way, and that's called self-funding. So if you go to the next slide, so in self-funding, which actually the majority of people who have employer-sponsored health insurance who get their insurance through their job their employer is actually self-funded. And when employer is self-funded, that means that you still have the same four participants. However, when the employee goes to the doctor or the hospital, the money doesn't come from the insurance company. The money comes from the employer themselves. You can see the arrow, the diagonal arrow from the upper left to the lower right going from the employer straight to the provider and pharmacy. So the employer is bearing the risk. Now, of course, the employer is like, what are we going to do? Have HR get all the bills from all the doctors and write a whole bunch of checks? Like, we can't have our HR department doing that. That's crazy. So they hire the insurance company to administer it. So all these employees think they have Blue Cross United, Cigna, or Aetna, and the doctor in the hospital, they still bill Blue Cross United, Cigna, or Aetna. But when it comes time to pay the doctor in the hospital, the money doesn't come from Blue Cross United, Cigna, Aetna. Blue Cross United, Cigna, Aetna have access to the company's bank account. And Blue Cross United, Cigna, Aetna wire the money from the company to the doctor and the hospital. So in a self-funded arrangement, Blue Cross United Signa, they don't take any risk at all. They really are like Visa and MasterCard. They're just processing the transaction. It is the employer that is bearing the risk in a self-funded environment. So for the sake of time, I'm gonna, I could talk more about that, but I won't, I'm gonna move on. Okay, next slide, please. So this gets us to the bills. Right, because so many of your projects are around billing and claims adjudication. So, um, if you can think about that employer employee, bleh, if you think about the doctor and the hospital in the bottom right, and then sending the bill up to the insurance company in the top right, those bills have codes on them. Now, there is a facility bill in America, which is referred to as a UB04, the Universal Bill from 2004. And then a bill from a doctor is referred to as a HICFA 1500. And HICFA stands for the Healthcare Financing Administration, which is what the old name of, of CMS used to be. So HICFA changed its name to CMS. That's why the doctor bills are called HICFAs. Now, on the bills, all bills have to have a diagnosis. It, a diagnosis can be a symptom. It can just be cough. Cough isn't a disease. Cough is a symptom. 
or it can have an actual disease like diabetes is a disease, pneumonia is a disease. All of those diseases have codes. All of those codes are ICD-10 codes, the International Classification of Diseases. ICD-10 codes are alphanumeric, so you'll see numbers and letters in there. They can be anywhere from three to seven digits, okay? So that is, you know, what, what the problem was, okay? Then there is what was done about it, and what was done about it is referred to as the CPT code, the current procedural terminology. Now, all outpatient so so not from staying overnight in the hospital, but all doctor's office visits, all same day surgery. If you have say, if you have an outpatient procedure at a hospital, all of those bills have a CPT code and that CPT code. It could be like you had an MRI. So you have a CPT code for an MRI. You have an office visit with a pediatrician. You have a CPT code for the office visit. All CPT codes are always numeric and they're always five digits. Now, for inpatient services only, where you stay overnight at the hospital, let's say you have pneumonia, lung infection, you need to have IV antibiotics, you end up staying in the hospital for a week, okay? The hospital doesn't, you don't bill inpatient bills with CPT codes. Instead, you use what are referred to as DRG codes, which is diagnosis-related group codes. Now, if this wasn't enough, there's also an additional set of codes that are referred to as HixPix codes. And HixPix codes are typically for things like um, IV infusions, like chemotherapy. So just know that there's an even an additional set of codes because the ICD-10 CPT DRG codes weren't enough. We had to have more codes. Now, those codes are put together by the billing department of the doctor or the hospital where they're literally looking at the electronic medical record, or sometimes if they're looking at the paper chart, and they're pulling out the information from what was done at the hospital, and they're translating that into a bill, which is then sent out, okay? And so, and that is referred to as the billed charges. So all that gets compiled together and sent out in a bill as billed charges. And so what you have here is then uh, an example of what the negotiation is between the billed charges and what is referred to as the allowed amount. So the billed charges that the hospital sends to the insurance company is never what they get paid back. A discount is applied, and that discount can be as much as 10%, 50%, 90%. So a hospital might bill an insurance company for a hundred thousand dollars, but the hospital and the insurance company have negotiated the allowed amount, which is the true price. So whenever you talk about prices in healthcare, there's always two prices. There's the bill charges that the doctor and the hospital send to the hospital, but then there's the allowed amount that the insurance company then sends back to the doctor or the hospital. And it's the allowed amount that is the quote unquote true price. And it's the allowed amount that is the negotiated amount between the insurance company and the doctor and the hospital. So let's go through an example here on this grid of how these allowed amounts are negotiated. So let's pick an, an insurance company, Blue Cross. Blue Cross goes to hospital A and says, hey, we need to negotiate our contract. And the hospital says, hey, we need to get paid. In other words, the allowed amount, $2,000 for every MRI that we do. And Blue Cross says, that's a lot of money. So you've got to, it's, it's super expensive for an MRI. So you've got to give us a better deal somewhere else in the contract. And so the hospital comes back and says, okay, we'll do a knee surgery, like an arthroscopic knee surgery. We'll do it for $4,000. Blue Cross says, hey, that's a pretty good deal. And then they do that for delivering babies, for ER services, for liver surgery, you name brain surgery, you name it. They negotiate back and forth for all the different services at a hospital. Next, Blue Cross then goes across town to Hospital B and has the exact opposite conversation. Nice. Hospital B says, hey, we'll accept $500 for MRI. And Blue Cross says, that is amazing. That's a super cheap amount. Thank you so much, Hospital B. That's fantastic. But then Hospital B comes back and says, uh-uh-uh, but we want $16,000 for every single 
knee surgery that we do at our hospital. And Russ is like, whoa, that is a lot of money. But because you gave us such a good deal on the MRIs, we'll agree to it. So you can see that if you have Blue Cross insurance, if you're a Gen Zion employee and you have Blue Cross of it, have Blue Cross insurance, the price of an MRI for you is hugely different depending upon where you go. If you have if you have that MRI at Hospital B, that's a good price at five hundred dollars. If you have that hospital, if you have that MRI at Hospital A at two thousand dollars, that's a super high price. Likewise, if you have your knee surgery at Hospital B, that's super expensive. And if you have that knee surgery at Hospital A, that's much more affordable. And that impacts the individual patient's out-of-pocket cost because, again, with everyone's insurance, you have a deductible and you have coinsurance. And so your deductible in America, on average, is about $2,000. So you, the patient, would be paying the entire difference between hospital B and hospital A for the MRI. And then likewise, for the orthopedic surgery, you'd be paying the 20% difference. You have to take you know, the 20% tw the, the difference between the, you take the 2,000 out of the 4,000 and the 2,000 out of the 16,000. So then you take 20% of 2,000 versus 20% of 16,000, and that's your out-of-pocket cost difference for your knee surgery. So people in America were like, okay, fine. Tell me the prices in advance. And guess what the insurance companies and in all the hospitals said? No, you cannot know the price in advance. And of course, everybody in America was like, that is the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard. So they all complained to their congressmen and their senators. Now, keep in mind, this took like 20 years. This shenanigans went on more than 20. This, this shenanigans went on for like 40 years. And then finally, in 2021, they passed a law where they said, hey, hospitals, you actually have to tell people these prices of these MRIs and these orthopedic surgeries in advance. OK, and then guess what? Every guess what? Seventy five percent of hospitals in America said, nope, we're still not going to do it. We're just going to flagrantly disobey what you're doing. And so then the government said, OK, well, we'll fine you. But the government has been like, well, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to upset the hospitals or whatever. So the government has been super slow to find these hospitals. So believe it or not, even though this law is two years old, only a hand, 75 percent of hospitals in America do not comply with the law. And only a handful of hospitals have actually been fined. So I will get into more detail about that later on. But um, let's go to the next slide. And then Harsh, were you going to say something? I was. I was going to say, hey, it is quite a complex topic. Each of these slides is an hour long of discussion, uh, literally, if we wanted to get deeper into this. But I think the most critical part, I think, Dr. Bricker, you hit on is it is impacting each and every employee's pocketbook on their own. And hence, price transparency is a very big deal. Um, a lot of folks who are not you know, seeing this or a part of the US healthcare system, they say, hey, but the insurance company pays it, you don't pay it. That's not true. Uh, with yeah. a lot of high deductible plans, customers are paying a, more and more a lion's share of the spend uh, that is going out in the initial $5,000, $10,000 out of their own pocket because of those deductibles that Dr. Bricker talked about. Hence, it's extremely important for folks when we go on Amazon or we compare and price shop uh, hotels and airlines, we know the price and hence it's become an increasingly hot issue uh, for folks to want to know the price of the things they're spending on healthcare. So it's a very, very important topic, not just for the solutions we build, but also for folks who we are, uh, you, know, you know, if you engage with folks who are dealing with the healthcare system, there is a lot of frustration uh, on this topic as well. So I want to hand it over back to Dr. Bricker, but I just wanted to add that context because a lot of folks think, hey, it's not really the customer who pays it. So thank you. Yes, wonderful addition. Thank you, Harsh. Now, there are some basic terms in, in the creation of a medical bill and the payment of that medical bill. So let's start over on the left. So the provider, like the doctor or the hospital, 
they create their build charges. Let's say it's $100,000 for a knee replacement. Those build, how did, how did they come up with $100,000? That comes from something at the hospital called the charge master. So the charge master is the list of prices for every single thing at a hospital. An aspirin, $3. A bag of IV fluid, $115. 30 minutes in the operating room, $3,000. So you add up all of those um, charges from the charge master, and that's how you get the total bill. And then you run that bill, now we're in the middle column, through the insurance contract. And then there's various methodologies for calculating the discount. So it's not just like, Blue Cross doesn't just go to the hospital and say, hey, we're gonna pay you 50% less of what you bill us. You bill us 10,000, we pay you five. You bill us 100,000, pay, we pay you 50. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. It's super complicated. And we're gonna get into some of those complexities. The reason those complexities are so important is because they're incredibly error prone. And frankly, a lot of what can be done through software can fix those errors, okay? Uh, and there's a ton of inefficiency because the process is so error prone that they have to have a lot of people review the bills. And every time they have a person review the bill, it costs them $25 a bill to review the bill. And that is super expensive. And so to the extent that either, and the bills have to be reviewed on both the, the hospital side and the insurance company side. And so to the extent that the percentage of bills that have to be reviewed by hand can be decreased, then that can save gobs of money. That is a huge area of inefficiency, okay? And then finally, after you run through all those different discount methodologies, then you get to what is referred to as the contracted rate or the allowed amount. So now, because you're such an educated healthcare expert now, if anybody asks you about the price or talks about the price in healthcare, the first thing out of your mouth should be, are you talking about bill charges or the allowed amount? And you're going to sound super intelligent because that's a very important thing to know when you're talking about price. Okay, next slide. Now I'm going to go through these next few at a high level for the sake of time. Okay, there's what's uh, called a case rate where the the final allowed amount is just determined by the um, the the contract. Okay, so this is typically used for like imaging. So like your MRIs, your classic example. So this is where a hospital A charges three thousand dollars for an MRI. They've negotiated a fixed case rate of two thousand dollars, and then the allowed amount is just equal to the case rate two thousand dollars. Hospital B, they bill a thousand dollars. The case rate is eight hundred dollars, and so the final allowed amount is just eight hundred dollars. Now here's what the sneaky insurance company says to the employer. Hey, we report back how much we've saved you through our discount. And they sell, tell the employer, hey, employer, you saved $1,000 at Hospital A, but you only saved $200 at Hospital B. So at Hospital A, you saved from $3,000 to $2,000, so the difference is 1000 bucks. And at Hospital B, you saved from $1,000 to $800, so that's $200. So which hospital did you save more money? Oh, you saved more money at Hospital A. You should be happy about that. No, you should not be happy about that, right? So the quote unquote discount, how much you quote unquote saved off of bill charges is a completely fictitious number. So because those bill charges are a fictitious number, they just make them up because the prices in the charge master are completely fictitious. Does an aspirin cost $3? Of course not. You can get an aspirin from Dr. Reddy. You could probably get a million aspirins from Dr. Reddy's, the huge maker of gen uh, generic medications in India, right? You could probably get a million aspirin tablets for $3, okay? So one particular aspirin does not cost $3. So they make it, make it up. They mark it up so that they can make more money. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, next up. A, there is a percent of charge discount. So sometimes the insurance company in the hospital say, hey, we'll just get, we'll just pay you a percentage of what you build us. And oftentimes this is used for surgery. So hospital A, let's say it's for a gallbladder surgery. So hospital A will bill $9,000. They've negotiated a 50% reimbursement rate with the insurance company. So the insurance company pays them back $4,500. The 9,000 times 0.5. Now hospital B, has negotiated a much better deal 
OK, they get 75 percent reimbursement, only a 25 percent discount. So you take the now they only bill four thousand dollars, though. So they bill four thousand. You multiply it by the point seven five. And so the allowed amount, the amount that the insurance company actually pays out to the hospital is only three thousand dollars. Again, I ask you. The insurance company goes to the employer and says, look, we got a much better deal at hospital A. We've got a 50% discount. At hospital B, we only have a 25% discount. You should be happy to have your employees go to hospital A because you have a better discount. No, do not go to hospital A. Because what happened is, is that hospital A said, look, we're going to give Blue Cross a 50% discount, but then we're just going to bill a lot more. So it completely negates the fact that they gave him a discount. I'm sure there, there might be some businesses in India that engage in this exact same thing. Let me mark up the price so I can give you a good deal. Half off. What a deal. They didn't tell you that they doubled the price beforehand. OK, so that's what happens with these percentage charge contracts. Next slide, please. OK, now there are carve outs. So a carve out is when a specific implant is used, like the artificial joint for a knee, or a lot of times in spine surgery, they have to use rods and screws to repair the spine. Or for people with cardiac uh, problems, um, they have a pacemaker or they'll get stents put in for a blocked artery for a cardiac catheterization. And so the hospital will bill for the specific knee replacement separately. They'll bill for each rod and screw in the spine surgery separately. They'll bill for each stent separately. And some people with really bad heart disease might get seven, eight, nine stents put in their heart during one procedure. So at hospital A, they'll charge, let's say $60,000 for a pacemaker to be put in there. You know, their heart is either beating too fast or too slow, so they got to have a pacemaker put in. So they'll bill $60,000. Now, there is a fixed case rate of 30,000, but then there's a specific line item, 20,000 ch charge for the pacemaker itself. So the total reimbursement to the hospital is 50,000, 30,000 to do the pacemaker, and then the 20,000 for the pacemaker itself. Now, Hospital B didn't negotiate that carve out with the insurance company. There's no law that says you have to negotiate a, a, a carve out. In fact, the insurance company doesn't want the carve out. The hospital is the one that wants the carve out. So hospital B is like, eh, we're not going to try to push on a carve out. So we're just going to charge $50,000 for the, the whole thing, for the nurses, for the lights, for the actual procedure itself, including the pacemaker. And then we'll negotiate a total amount of 40 grand all in for the, um, for the pacemaker and the procedure. And so again, the hospital A is much more expensive because they had a line item carve out for the actual implant itself. Now, here's the here's the kicker for things like knee replacements. The carve out for the knee replacement might be thirty thousand dollars. That's a car. They charge the price of a car for just the implant itself. OK, the hospital then purchased from the maker of that implant. They then purchased that for three thousand dollars. That's right. They marked it up twenty seven thousand dollars. Guess how much it cost the maker of the of that implant to actually make the implant? It cost three hundred dollars. So the maker of the implant itself marked up from three hundred to three thousand, and then the hospital marked it up from three thousand to thirty thousand for a three hundred dollar implant. So people, all oh, this medical technology, it's super expensive. No, it costs. $300 to make an actual knee implant. Healthcare in America is expensive, not because healthcare is expensive. It's just because it's a great way to make money. Okay, so profiteering, profiteering is why healthcare is expensive in America. Next slide, please. All right. I'm going to skip provider stop losses. Believe it or not, it goes on and on. It just keeps going. Okay, so your head is spinning. Probably not. You guys are super smart. Your head is probably not spinning, um, but it keeps going on. OK, next slide, please. OK, so strategic rate setting is just the, the industry term that hospitals use to make up their prices. So believe it or not, hospitals in America hire big consulting firms like Ernst & Young and Deloitte and all these other consulting firms to, to look at their charge master and say, hey, consulting firm, will you tell us how to, to strategically set our rates 
so that we can maximize our reimbursement. So it's actually a huge source of revenue for consulting firms is working for hospitals, telling them how to set their prices. All right, next slide, please. Now, there is no connection to quality whatsoever with these prices. When the hospital says, hey, we want to get paid a lot more for this surgery um, than the other hospitals in our town, it's not like because they have better outcomes. There's no connection whatsoever. In fact, they've done studies to show that the hospitals that actually are lower cost overall actually have higher quality because in America with your commercial insurance, the hospital still gets paid for complications. So you have a complication from your surgery and you have to go back into the hospital, the hospital gets paid again. So there is no financial incentive for the hospital for you to not have complications. Now, I don't think they're evil people. I don't think they're going out of their way to have complications, of course not. But it doesn't hurt them financially. In fact, they did a study, a Dr. Atul Gawande, you're probably familiar with him. He's one of the most famous doctors in America. He actually did a study in the, and that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. I think it was in 2013 where he, he looked at um, the, the finances for a hospital and he found that they made more money and actually had a higher profit margin the more complications they had. OK, so there is no connection between, quote unquote, higher prices and higher quality. In fact, it's just the opposite. Next slide, please. OK, so why for Gen Zion and all the other employers in America, why is 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 why does it cost so much money? Why is it ten thousand dollars per employee per year? Well, from a hospital's perspective, they get their revenue stream, their revenue sources is about forty percent from Blue Cross uh, United Cigna Aetna from commercial insurance. It's about 10% from Medicaid, and it's about 40% from Medicare. So about 40% is coming from the government, 40% is coming from employers, 10% is coming from Medicaid, and 10% is self-paid because the person just doesn't have insurance at all. Okay, now, the government pays so much less than commercial insurance that essentially the hospitals overbill Blue Cross United Signet Aetna to make up for the low reimbursement from Medicare. So the government knows this. So when the government tells the hospital, we're only going to pay you $15,000 for a knee replacement, or we're only going to pay you $55 for an office visit, that the, the government knows that that's not enough for the hospital. And But they're like, but we don't care because we're the government and we can do whatever we want. And so the, the hospital and the doctors, they all turn around to their to the commercial insurance companies are like, look, we're getting paid so little by Medicare that we actually have to charge you just a ton more to pay for all these low payments for all the senior patients that we have. And so it's essentially a hidden tax. So not and, and remember, all the employees in America, they're paying, they have to pay premium to their employer, comes out of their paycheck. They have to pay their deductible, they have to pay their coinsurance. So both employed people in America and their employer are essentially secretly subsidizing the underpayment by the government to doctors and hospitals. So it's called it's called cross subsidization. So that and this has been going on for decades. So that cross subsidization in America is why it's so expensive for um, people under the age of 65. It's so expensive for their health care. Uh, next slide, please. OK. So because this is so, you might hear a term called value-based care because the entire billing and collection process is so complicated and so error-prone and is so expensive itself. Keep in mind, a doctor and a hospital themselves spend anywhere from 10 to 20% of their revenue just on revenue cycle management. Just to get paid, they have to spend anywhere from 10 to 20% of their revenue. Hospitals have thousands and thousands of billing employees to send out bills. And health insurance companies have thousands and thousands of employees to process those claims. And so the movement in America that's still very small is just to say, forget all this. It's so inefficient. Let's just do something called, and, and that, that billing world that I just described to you that it exists in 99% of America today. That's called fee for service. Okay. Now, value based care, another name for that is capitation, which is look, 
I, the insurance company, or I, the government, I'm just going to pay you, the doctor, or you, the hospital, a lump sum to take care of that person for the entire year. And you don't even have, you don't have to send us a bill, okay? It's like, and guess what? The hospital gets to save tons of money because they don't have to send out bills for those people. And the insurance company gets to save money because they don't have to have people on their end processing the bills on their side as well. But the problem is then each doctor and hospital then has to bear the risk for that individual because it's a capitated amount. So if the insurance company gives the hospital $10,000 per employee, well, then if the employee ends up costing $12,000, the hospital's on the hook and they're bearing the risk. And the vast majority of hospitals and doctors in America have no interest in value-based care and have no interest in bearing that risk because they don't want it. Now, it, it healthcare is filled with buzzwords and fads OK, so you need to just need to know that value based care is a buzzword and people talk about it a lot. But the vast majority of doctors and hospitals in America have not adopted value based care and they do not want value based care because they do not want to bear the risk. They just want to provide services and bill for them. OK, now let's talk about price transparency briefly here at the end. Um, I added one more slide. I don't know if it was able to make it in. If not, that's totally fine. Go on to the next slide. Beautiful, thank you for adding it in. So the price transparency regulation that went in place on January 1st of 2021 said that the hospitals actually had to release their bill charges, their allowed amounts, what the cash prices are, and the allowed amounts for each individual insurance company, Blue Cross United, Cigna, Aetna, for every single service that they do, but it has to be in a machine readable file. And then they told all the insurance companies more recently in 2022, insurance companies, you have to do the same thing in a machine readable file. All the hospitals and the insurance companies then hired IT consultants to create quote unquote machine readable files that were terabytes in size so that people could not analyze them. They intentionally made them unreadable. They made the machine readable files unreadable. And there are startups in America that are using Amazon Web Services and spinning up different instances. And they have to sp spin up so many instances that they have to get on the phone with the AWS people because the AWS people are like, why do you need this much computing power? This is ridiculous. Like we don't give this much compute computing power to people. Be like, look, we're just trying to read the machine readable files. So they um, so they have again fully intentionally tried to obscure the prices. Okay, so there's a second part of the rule. The second part of the rule is, which is point number three here, there also must be 300 shoppable service. In other words, not like a heart attack, because that's an emergency, right? If you're having crushing chest pain, you're not gonna go online and shop for a cardiologist for your chest pain, right? You're just gonna go to the ER. Or if you're in a car accident and you're bleeding, you're not gonna shop for a hospital when you're bleeding, right? So it's just shoppable things, right? And believe it or not, the vast majority of things in healthcare are not emergencies. And so you're like, hey, you know what? I need a colonoscopy or I need a, the, the gastroenterologist to look in my stomach for an upper endoscopy. That's not emergent. It can happen next week or in a couple of weeks. I can shop for it or I, I need a knee replacement. I can shop for that. I've been dealing with my knee pain for years. I can wait another couple of weeks for a knee surgery. It's not a big deal, okay? Those have to be on a website. Um, that has to be consumer friendly. Okay, so this is the part where the American hospitals have, you know, so every hospital in America should have a website to be like, hey, I need a knee replacement. Can I just go on your website? And I got Blue Cross and you need to list out what my Blue Cross is actually gonna, gonna cost me. And that's where the government has specified 70 services and then they let the, the hospital decide what the other 230 services are that, it, that they wanna make shoppable on their hospital website. So it's like an office visit, an MRI, joint surgery, you know, just like a simple blood test, let's say like a cholesterol test, like those are shoppable things. And this is where 75% of the hospitals in America are not compliant and the vast majority of them are not being fined for it. So. You know, healthcare in America is a huge game of cat and mouse and deception because it's the largest industry in America, right? It's 18% of the US GDP. It's over $4 trillion 
Um, and so there's so much money in it that people are fighting tooth and nail to grab a hold of that as much as humanly possible. And listen, as a as a physician and you as software programmers, we have a fantastic opportunity to really just help people. I mean, the reason why I do these presentations and the reason why what you do is so important is because ultimately it's the patient and their health and not bankrupting them that's so important. And so what you do in that is hugely important. So like, just know if you're in India or the Philippines or you're in America, like, and listen, we're all in the brotherhood of humanity. Like, I don't care that you're in India and I'm in America, right? We're, we're all children of a higher power, okay? And so it's super important for us to help each other out. Okay, and that's it for today. Thank you so much, Harsh. No, thank you, Dr. Bricker. I think, uh, you know, one thing I would like to share here, um, I wanna make sure if I can, um, you guys can hear me all right? 